Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Quinn. I'm the youth pastor here at the church. And as Micah said earlier, we are heading out to camp and we're really excited. I just found out the official number. I've been waiting to hear. We are, uh, so we are taking 16. I've known that number. We are taking 16 of our high schoolers this week. And there will be 85 total that'll be there this week with 23 counselors and staff. So it's going to be a full week. It's going to be awesome. And we're really excited to see what God is going to do. And so we're starting a new series this morning. It's called Last Word. It's from the book of 2 Peter. We're going to be studying the entire book throughout the next five weeks. And it's really important for us to understand this book because it's in the Bible. It is part of God's word. And so I want to start by telling you a little bit of a story. I was in middle school and high school. I had this friend who uh, grew up in the church and actually his dad was a pastor. And kind of the ironic thing is that later on, uh, my, my friend you know, told me at the time that he had a grandfather that was a, a seminary professor. I actually, for one of my seminary class on preaching was written by my friend's grandpa. Like, I had to use that as my textbook. So this is kind of the legacy of faith that is in my friend's life. And his dad eventually, as a pastor, started doing some research and started to kind of compare Christianity with other religions and somehow came to the conclusion that they were the same thing. This is a man in ministry as a pastor who looked at other religions and Christianity and, said, and came to the conclusion they're the same thing. There's no difference. So he resigned from his pastor job, left the church, left his faith in general, and along with him, his six kids, including my friend. And there was this one time we were in high school after I came to faith in Christ and, and really started to believe this for myself, just like, you know, I grew up in a Christian home too and took it upon myself to, you know, made it my own when I was 15. And so I tried to share my faith with him frequently. And there was this one time we were having a conversation and we were talking about the Sermon on the Mount, some of Jesus' most pointed words and most direct words on what he commands for us to do. And he asked me this question. If God knows that we can't obey him fully, why does he set such high standards of perfection to know him? It was this intense question. As a 17-year-old, I did the best that I could to answer this question. But I didn't have the full uh, or have more, uh, have as much knowledge as I do now in order to answer that question. I had a really hard time. And also because I started to think about it. I was like, wait a minute. What does that mean for me? I, I, I want to obey Jesus with all my life. But I also know that I can't. Like, I, I can't obey him fully because I have a sin nature. I still have to struggle through that. And so we might all be sitting here wondering that same thing. What does that look like for us to live a life of obedience to God, even though these uh, standards are so high for us? What do we do? We, ha we might say, I have the hardest time obeying God. I believe him, but I don't know how to do that. Well, there's a couple things we need to learn. First of all, we need to learn that God does ultimately command and demand for us obedience to his commands. Like he puts it out there. This is what he wants for us to do. But also on the other side is that God also supplies what we need in order to do that. We're not left to our own devices to figure this out. And we can't drift into this idea that because we have grace, you know, we're not required to then obey God, that we're not required to do that because that's just not a category that Peter and the other New Testament apostles have. They don't have a category where you get to not obey God and live a life that pleases him. So if a, tr a person truly believes in Christ, they will want to give evidence to the fact that they believe. And so how do we do this? How do we live a life of obedience to Christ? without it turning into this idea where we can somehow earn God's grace because of the good things that we're doing? Or, and, and, and how do we continue in this grace what, because we believe in Jesus? And how do we continue in this grace to live a life that is godly before our Father? And so here's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at four truths about God's grace that will lead us in obeying God and living a Christ-like life. And so let Let's let this be our overarching thought for this morning, that God's grace not only saves us from our sins, but enables us in growth, imparts God's divine power, necessitates our obedience, and sustains us to live a godly life. These are the things we're going to learn this morning. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, if you do not have a Bible with you, there should be a brown hardcover back Bible in the seat in front of you. Uh, that'll be on page 1225. And if you still don't have one, I will 
I have it on the screen for you to look at as well. But let me give you a little bit of a background for 2 Peter. There's a reason we're calling this series Last Words. It's because we believe that Peter was writing this aware and knowing that his death was coming soon. And so he was kind of giving his last words, his last statement to these churches he had built a relationship with and had written to before, we believe, in 1 Peter, these group of churches in Asia Minor. And so Peter is writing and what he's trying to do, he's actually trying to restore order in some ways because the church had kind of gotten chaotic. These false teachers had come in and started teaching these ideas that were not the same thing of what Peter and the apostles had been given to, by Jesus to teach. And so here's some of the things. There's some prominent features that we can see throughout the book of 2 Peter that give us a clue as to what these false teachers were teaching. First of all, they were denying that Jesus was ever going to return and life was just going to continue to go on as it always has. It's kind of is what they believed. And as a result, because they denied that Jesus was going to return, that there wasn't any sort of coming judgment for the way that we live our lives. And so now we are free to live however we want. So these false teachers were truly living that out. They were living, I'm uh, going to use this word, licentious lifestyles. Basically, they were pursuing every single pleasure and thing they wanted to without any regard for what God wanted them to do. And they took this idea of being free in Christ to a whole level that the apostle Paul, who wrote that idea, did not take it to and did not mean by it. So these teachers would claim to be Christians. They would claim to follow Jesus. And we can see that by the fact that Peter doesn't say anything about correcting their theology when it came to the person of Jesus. He doesn't correct any of that. But he does call them out and say that they need to, that actually to be a true follower of Christ, that your life needs to give evidence to this fact that you believe in him. And so Peter calls them out for being liars. And uh, as we'll see in a few weeks, Peter says some very blunt and serious things to these people about who they are and what they really are about. And we'll see that when we get there. But this whole book really is truly about proclaiming the grace of God in the person of Jesus and the, and the continual transformational work that God wants to do in every single one of our lives. So let's begin in verse one. Here we go. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ has, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So he begins with a very standard greeting, starts off by mentioning who he is, and then he talks about what he does. And first of all, he says, a servant. Our translation that we use at our church, we call the NIV, the New International Version, this soft, it's, the word is softened. What's actually the word there is the word for slave, the Greek word doulos. And we do that because we have such a loaded connotation in our culture about what that word means. But when you think about it in the context of a person who claims to be a follower of Christ, it makes total sense to call someone a slave in this sense that we look at Jesus as our Lord and as our master, and he's a good and kind kind and loving master and that we submit to his will and we do what he wants us to do and that he's kind in that way. He's not um, overbearing and he's not cruel like some of those, uh, like the way we might associate with that word slave. And then he says he's an apostle and he's basically pointing to the fact that he has been appointed by God to deliver these messages, that, this is, that he, has he has been appointed by God to have the authority to share the gospel and to call out what he's going to call out in this book about the false teachers. So then he identifies his audience. He's, instead of identifying a specific place, he identifies their state before God. To those who through the righteousness of God, our God and Savior Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. So he's saying that this, this whole idea, and this is actually kind of a, a summary of the gospel right here, that they have been given the righteousness of God through faith. And this, this is what the gospel truly is, is that this morally perfect, holy, righteous God took on flesh in the person of Jesus and who went to the cross and died for our sins. But when he was on that cross, he took on every single one of our sins, every single one of our sins, and past, present, future, all of them. And that when he died and then he rose again, that he 
paid for him, that that cleared the payment completely. And so that when we put our faith in him, now we take on the righteousness of God. It's one of the most beautiful verses in all the Bible that Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, where he says, he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. And that this was not in any activity of our own. This is not something that we produced on our own. And this is what he means by received a faith. That, that word received is basically literally casting a lot. Like it's a luck of the draw, a roll of the dice. Not necessarily that we're super lucky in that way, but what he means is that this was not something that we put together ourselves, that we were able to muster up on our own effort. That this was totally the activity of God to make this happen. And so here's where this gets to, as he says that this faith that has been given to us, that God has taken care of for us, it's as precious as ours, and this, it's as precious and valuable as his. He doesn't have a more precious or valuable version because of the fact that he's an apostle. We all have the same version, so it's this precious faith. So he's clarifying what has been done. He's making sure to share, to even say that this is what has happened to all of you. You, as the church, who have believed in Christ, this is the faith that you have received. And then he goes on to say another part of the greeting, a prayer. He says, grace and peace be yours in abundance. When he says that word grace, it's that unmerited favor of God to, to bless us, to give us Christ so that we could have a relationship with him, that we could be made right with him, that we could become like him. It's this grace upon grace that we don't deserve. We did not make this happen for ourselves. And then he uses that word peace. And what we have a, an interesting way that we have to think about peace because oftentimes our culture will think of peace as like an absence of conflict or something along the lines that, you know, we have this inner sense that, all right, I, I'm, everything's fine. I don't have any problems with my life. I'm calm. I'm at peace. What, he's, what he means here is the Hebrew word for shalom, which is an inward sense of completeness or wholeness, this contentment kind of thing where it life is complete. And so he's saying that he wants these things to be in abundance, to be overflowing in the life of a Christian, but that these come through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. That, that grace and peace would be ours in abundance through the knowledge. And what he means by the knowledge is that it's this belief that Jesus is who he says he is, that you have put your faith in him and you have been uh, transferred to the kingdom of God. Basically what we use the word in our Christian circles as converted, that you have come to faith in Christ. And it's this knowledge that now you have of God and of Jesus, our Lord, and that you view Jesus now as both your Lord, that you follow him, you serve him, you obey him, and also your savior, that he has saved you from your sins. And so when we see this idea that we want to grow in our knowledge and we want to see God move in our lives, that part of the beauty of the gospel is this first truth, is that God's grace enables our belief and growth through the knowledge of Christ. That when you give your life to Christ, when you put your faith in him, and you have come to a knowledge of who he really is, that he has come to be your Lord and Savior, that this paves the way for you to know him more and to grow in your relationship with him. We have a tendency to believe this kind of lie that once we've given our lives to Christ, it's now up to us to grow. But God gives us, and we'll see this in a minute, God enables us to grow. He gives us what we need. But I also think that we have a tendency to distrust this idea of knowledge, not just the knowledge of coming to faith in Christ, but the knowledge of having a deeper, intimately acquainted idea of, of, of knowing our faith. Like when I was in I'm Bible college, um, and I actually was realizing this the other day, I'm close to, uh, gosh, I'm close to 10 years since I graduated college. It's a, I can't believe how fast life moves sometimes, right? And, uh, but when I was in college, some of the people that, you know, some of the guys I you know, lived in with dorms would have this problem with obeying God. Like it was just this faux pas to try and think about trying to make effort to obey God as if that wasn't real faith, as if that wasn't legitimate. And so this idea of, of trying to know God and know theology was almost some way that like, wow, you can't, that's going to make you stiff. You're not going to be able to be a real lover of Jesus. 
But really, when we come to a full knowledge of who Jesus is and what he wants to do with, with our lives, that should lead us to be more loving, more gracious, more compassionate because we're becoming more like God. And so we shouldn't distrust knowledge. Instead, we should be pursuing it, as we'll talk about later, because this is the vessel that God will use to enable our belief and our growth because of having knowledge of him. Okay, let's continue. Verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So actually, we could translate this phrase, the very beginning of it, where you could put this phrase, seeing that. It's kind of connecting from verse 2 into verse 3. And what, how this works out is Peter prays for the grace and peace to abound in the life of believers through the knowledge of God. And that as a result, then, here are some of the resources that are available, these gracious things that God wants to do in your life. And that his, he's talking about Jesus when he says that his divine, and then his divine power, talking about the Holy Holy Spirit. So when you believe in Jesus, when you put your faith in him, the Holy Spirit now resides within you. And this divine power is now in you. It's the same power that raised Christ from the dead, as we have been saying a lot in our church lately. And that this divine power, listen to this, and I want you to understand these next few things, because if you truly understand this, this can totally radically change the way that you view your Christian life. Listen to this. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Everything. You have, if you have, if you have believed in Christ, if you put your faith in him, you have everything you need to live a godly life. So when I was, I used to work at a daycare before I got this job here at, at the church. And one of the phrases I heard all the time from the kids there, they would say, Mr. Chris, I can't do it. I don't know how. I don't want to. All blah, blah, blah. All those things. Okay. Heard that so many times. And I get so frustrated. But here's the thing. We might feel that very same thing as Christians. We might look up to God and say, God, I can't do it. I don't know how. I don't want to. Here's the thing. You have to understand this. You have been given everything you need to live that godly life. It is right there for you for the taking. And then when he says that phrase, godly life, most translations split those words and say life and godliness. When we talk about life, we're talking about the life that you are living here and now up through eternity. And then this godliness idea is that you live in a manner that reflects God, that looks and acts and thinks like Jesus. Not that you're perfect, but that you do this, that this is your life now to live a godly life. And so God has given you everything you need to do that. Everything. And so this is not something that God has just kind of left, again, left to ourselves to figure out. But then he says, look at this, through our knowledge of him. So it's, again, it's through that knowledge of coming to faith in him, knowing that he is Lord and Savior of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. That idea of calling is this effective awakening and creation of faith within us. That God has worked this plan out, that God has, and then he's called us by revealing himself for who he is, that glory and goodness, that his perfect, morally righteous, holy character that would become beautiful and compelling, that we would see him for who he is, and we would see him for his love, we would see him for his grace, and we'd be captivated by that because he is so unlike anything else that we have seen in our world, that we might see in any part of our daily lives, this gracious and loving and compassionate God he called us by that, that we would be compelled and we would see what he did through Jesus on the cross and we would say, I want to follow that God. I want to give my life to that God who willingly gave of himself for us. But then he says, through these, and he's talking about God's glory and goodness, he has given us his very great and precious promises. This idea of the fact that Christ will return, that Christ will give us everything we need to live a godly life. These promises that Christ will be with us, all of these kind of great, amazing promises. And then he says, so that through them, these promises, you may participate in the divine nature. Here's another thought that if you understand this, this can absolutely change the way you see your faith in Christ. Because not only 
Are you saved and forgiven of your sins? Not only do you have everything you need in order to live a godly life, but also now you get to participate in all of who God is. His character, his mercy, his love, all of that. You get to participate in that. You get to participate in sharing that with the rest of the world, with his mission. But mostly what this also means is that that you get to share in becoming more like Jesus. Guys, that's the, that's the ultimate culmination of what God is trying to do through the gospel. He's trying to make us like him. Not make us him, not make us become him, but become like him, that we would reflect him with our character. And that will be fully culminated in the return of Christ. And we'll talk about that in other weeks. But here's the thing, we get to participate in that. And that what used to be ourselves is that, and he says this, having escaped through the corruption in the world. And Paul actually calls it being rescued from this world. That we are pulled out and we are escaped from the corruption. So instead of uh, corruption where things are kind of falling apart and we're dwindling and we're uh, not having a relationship with God, instead we are being built up to become more like God. And so this is, there's a beautiful principle here and this beautiful truth This is our second truth, that God's grace imparts God's divine power needed to live the godly life we are called to live. I want to read another verse for you. It won't be on the screen. I want you to hear this and just listen to it. This is from 2 Corinthians 9, 8. This is Paul talking. He says, And God is able to bless you abundantly so that, listen to this, in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Notice he doesn't use some things, some times, some work. He says all. He repeats that word three times in the matter of just a few words. Let me read it again. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every, work, in every good work. That God has given you, again, everything you need to live a godly life. In every situation you might face, God has given you what you need to do that, to live a godly life. And so this is actually probably how I would answer my friend now if we were to sit down and have the same conversation 15 years later, how I would answer this question. This is actually from a a commentator I studied for this week. Um, His name is Thomas Schreiner. He's very, very good. And what he says is, the call to godliness is rooted in and secured by God's grace. His gracious power supplies what he demands. So yes, God demands these things, but he also supplies what we need. So if there's anything you're struggling with in order to live a godly life, whether it's in your mind, whether it's in a sin issue that you're dealing with and can't seem to stop, whether it's something in your body, there's everything, God has given you everything you need to live a godly life through it, to change you, to radically become the person that he has called you to be. You have everything you need. And so the question then becomes this. Are you living your life as if you are participating in all of who God is or simply reacting to the day-to-day cares of the world? Because I think if we're honest, and I'm being honest, this is me too, I think we, are, we tend way more to just react. React to what's going on to our world instead of being proactive and saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue God. I'm going to participate in God's divine nature and make this the, the cry of my heart, the, the goal of my life. Let's continue, verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. So we look at this phrase, this, for this very reason, it's very similar to when a, a writer in the Bible uses the word therefore. And as my high school Sunday school teacher reminded us all the time, we have to ask the question, what's the therefore, therefore? So we look back, it connects. It's a connecting phrase to go back to what was just said. And so he's saying, because we have everything we need for a godly life and we can participate in the divine nature with, in view that there is a future culmination of Christ making us fully perfect before him and becoming like him, that what we should do now is to make every effort to add to your faith. Here's what I remember as well from my college days experience. We, we, there were just all these kind of disliking of effort 
Okay, this distrust of effort of saying, oh, we shouldn't put forth effort because then that means that we're trying to earn God's grace. We're trying to earn it. Instead, we should just kind of let God kind of just ask for God to co constantly change our hearts. And, and yes, we should be asking for God to change our hearts, but there's just truly no category in the Bible, especially with the New Testament writers, that there is such thing as passivity like that in Christianity. That we can't just sit on our hands and wait for God to do something. That, look at what he says, to make every effort, to be relentless in our pursuit of God. That we're going to do anything and everything we can. We don't have the option of sitting on our hands. We have to be moving and doing something. And then he says, make every effort to add. That adding, what he means there is about putting on something that is necessary. So this is not just some nice suggestion. He's actually saying these are necessary for your faith, these godly qualities. You need these to live a godly life. And so he makes, he makes the, this list of eight virtues, and he connects them through this idea, this, this Greek literary form. It's beautiful. It's awesome, where he takes a root kind of an idea, connects it all the way through. It's this chain of ideas that connects to a climax, and these eight virtues, they're not comprehensive. They're not, like, they're not all of what you need because, you know, there's the fruit of the Spirit, that there's other things, and there's all kinds of other things that we need to keep in mind as we do this. But what he's doing by connecting the, it this way with having faith at the beginning and love at the end, he's bookending it, and he's basically saying faith is the root of these virtues, like the beginning of these things, and that love is the goal and climax of the Christian life. To be a follower of Christ means to live in love. And it's not necessarily like if you sit there and you go, okay, all right, I'm going to take care of faith. All right, sweet. I think I've nailed faith. I'm going to move on to goodness. Cool. I, I've, I've nailed goodness. Let's move on to knowledge. It's not how that works. That's not what that means. What he's just simply saying is that these are all important, but they're rooted in faith and they come to their full culmination in, in love. And so I want to give you just a quick, brief description of each of these, uh, each of these virtues, because if I went in detail, uh, we'd be here till four o'clock, and we don't want that. So first he says, faith is the belief in Christ. So it's this idea that you believe in Jesus, you give your life to him. Secondly is the goodness, that this is this excellence of character that, ref that is uh, morally upright. Then you have knowledge, it's this proper understanding of your faith, this deep, intimate, acquainted knowledge that you're not just, it's not just little tidbits, but that you deeply know it. And then self-control is this measured restraint. And actually what he's doing here is he's giving kind of a sideways glance at the false teachers because they were not living in self-control. They were doing whatever they wanted. And so he's basically saying, this is what you need to have. You need to have self-control because you don't want to be like them. And he says perseverance, and this perseverance is about continuing in the faith despite persecution and trouble that you might face or rejection. Godliness, like we've already discussed, is this godly manner and the way that you live your life. And the mutual affection is the love that you have for your brothers and sisters in Christ, that you view them as your true family and you care for them and love for them. And that lastly, that you, that this love is this willingness to lay one's life down for another person. Because we know love by this, this is First John, First John three sixteen. We know love by this that Christ laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. That this is the definition of love: is Christ laying down His life for us, and it is the climax of all of these qualities in how we do this. And so we look at all of these different qualities and what we see, remember this phrase, make every effort. And so this is what grace, even though we have grace and we are forgiven no matter what we do, this is the third truth. God's grace necessitates that we put forth every effort to grow. I want you to start imagining the Christian life like the life of, a, of, a, of an athlete. If someone wants to be an athlete and to be a professional and to reach the, the top of their game, they have to put forth some effort. They might have all the talent. They might have all the physical tools, the smarts. They might have all of that. But if they're not willing to put forth the effort to make that happen, then they're not going to reach that top climax of their field. And when you think about, and I'm huge sports fan. I love watching sports all the time. Like I was even really upset that the World Cup was happening during first service. I was like, I want to watch that. Uh, and so you have, you know, you, you start to think about some of these all-time greats 
all right, of professional sports. You might have Michael Jordan, who was my all-time favorite as a kid. You have LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Jerry Rice, also one of my favorites because I'm a huge San Francisco 49ers fan. Sorry, Seahawks fans. And then you have also Tom Brady. I mean, I could list name upon name upon name. And even if you're not a sports fan and don't care or those names mean absolutely nothing to you, you have no idea who any of those people are, the point being that no matter what you try and pursue, if you don't put forth the effort to make it happen, it's, you're not going to reach that top of the field. And this is kind of the same thing for us as, as followers of Christ. We have been given, as Peter said, everything we need to live a godly life. It has been given to us, but now Peter is saying, make every effort to add these godly qualities. So if we want to have, we want to live a life that pleases God, we want to follow him more wholeheartedly, then that's, this is what we need to do, is to make every effort to do this. And this is why we actually have things that we, like, we call spiritual disciplines, Okay? These are things that you do, that you make an effort to use and as an opportunity to make you grow, to help you grow and become more like Christ. If you believe that you do these kinds of things and that in some ways this makes you, a, you know, uh, makes you earn God's favor or God is more pleased with you than other people because you're doing these things and that's where you lose sight of what these things are truly for. They're truly for helping you grow to become more like Christ. So if you view them in that way, then they'll they'll do their work. And so that's reading the Bible. That's studying it. That's memorizing it. Okay, that's praying. That's fasting. Okay, that's being generous with your money, sharing your faith, serving other people, serving in the church, being a part of the church. These are the spiritual, these are some of the spiritual disciplines. There's a lot more than that. But if you use these as a relentless pursuit of God to grow more in him, to know him more, these are the kind of things that will help you grow and they will not let you fail. Let's continue. Verse 8. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, for if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ." And so if you possess these qualities, if they are yours, if they are a part of your life, and they are, and he says, in increasing measure, what he doesn't mean is this calculated measurement of improvement. What he means is that it is overflowing, that it is abundant in your life. It is very clear that these things are happening in your life, that these godly qualities are overflowing out of your life. And so if you have those, look at he, what he says, they will keep you, these godly qualities will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. And what he means by ineffective is that whole idea, again, of being passive, of sitting on your hands and waiting for things to happen and not making an effort. So that basically it's this idleness, like this, this, uh, like it's the concept of this worker who, instead of going out and working and finding a job, what he's doing is goofing around and going to the marketplace and not doing what he needs to do. And then secondly, he says that you, to be unproductive, literally to be barren, to not be bearing any fruit whatsoever, that there's no result in your life. So he's basically saying in this knowledge that you have, of, that you've come to faith in Christ, you've come to know who he is, you've come to give your life to him, that you would not be ineffective, or that you would be effective and productive if you are possessing these qualities, that this would make you a productive follower of Christ. You would be able to share the gospel with people. This would become very real in your life. But then he makes this contrast. Whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind. Basically, the idea is that you're, you don't see your true spiritual condition before God, that you're blind. It's like, as James says in his book, in his letter in the Bible, that you see yourself in the mirror and then forget what you look like when you walk away that this is not the point of what the Christian is to be doing here. We're, we need to be remembering that we are forgiven. And, so he taught, and then he says, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. And so these kind of go back and forth. And what he's actually trying to say here is that these people are quite literally forgetting that they are living as forgiven sinners and instead they are behaving like the rest of the world or like unconverted people. And again, this is another sideways glance at the false teachers. 
Because they were living as if God had never saved them, as if God had never called them to live a holy life because they were doing whatever they wanted. So that when we give our lives to Christ, this is what we ought to do. And this is what Peter says. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort. There's the phrase again. To confirm your calling and election. He's saying basically make sure you make every effort to give evidence to the fact that this is that this is true in your life. Again, this is not something that like you are trying to earn God's favor, but that if, you, if you're a follower of Christ, you say, man, I, I want to live out of God's grace. I want to obey him. I need to make effort to see these things grow so that this becomes a natural part of my life where I'm effective and I am productive. And then he says this, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. This is not a promise like saying, if you do these things, if you add these God godly qualities to your life and you make an effort to add them to your life, that now you're never going to sin ever again. Like, that's not something that's in the Bible. It's just not, not there. You can't make the Bible say that. What he means is, is not falling away and basically rejecting Jesus, walking away from your faith. And I can certainly tell you throughout my life of following Christ, the people who I have seen walk away from their faith is because they did not put forth the effort. They were not pursuing Jesus with their heart. They had their heart set on completely other different things. And so this, what he's saying is, if you do these things, you will never stumble. And look at this, you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's not saying that Getting into heaven is based simply on doing these things, but that because there is evidence in your life that you have given your life to Christ, this is what will truly give you a rich welcome into, into heaven. Because we often shortchange the gospel. We make it so, uh, so basic that we actually forget kind of the whole completeness of it. That what we do is we say, if you pray this prayer, then you get to go to heaven someday. If you believe in Jesus, you get to go to heaven someday. And while that's absolutely true, there is this component that we need to live a true life before God and to, to live a life that pleases him. But that we also have to understand that when we do these things, when we pursue God by his grace, that he will sustain us. He will not let us stumble. He will not let us fall. So this is our fourth truth, that God's grace sustains us to live a godly life until we come to Christ's eternal kingdom. This is not a matter of Jesus leaving you to figure this out for yourself. It's him saying, I am going to give you what you need, as we talked about already. And by sustaining, I mean that he will hold you in his hands as you try to follow him. That he will, as you make an effort to add these qualities to your life. And he will continue to do this every single day of your life. He will hold on to you and build you up. And so to the point that he's going to keep doing this until the day that he returns or you pass away and enter into heaven, he's going to continue to do these things. And that pursuing these godly qualities is only done by his grace. Only he can do this in us. And remember, he supplies what he demands. He will do this for us. And so that, I mean, even Jesus said himself, apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. We often have a tendency, we live in a very uh, individualistic, self-sufficient culture that we can figure this out. We can do this ourselves. And Peter is, and is making this very clear that you can't. You can't do this on your own. And Jesus says it, apart from me, you can do nothing. And that is the attitude we need to have. So I want to, I want to close by asking this question. What do you have to lose by pursuing God more closely by his grace? What do you have to lose? Well, if we take Peter seriously at his word, we lose the opportunity to live a life of closeness with Jesus, a close relationship, intimate relationship with him, where we know him deeply. We lose the ability to participate in the divine nature and become more like Christ. And then lastly, that we lose the opportunity to enter into Christ's eternal kingdom. Because what we're doing when we don't say that we're gonna pursue God, when we don't pursue him by his grace and we continue to do whatever we want to do like the false teachers did, then what we're saying is, I don't actually want your life that you have given me, Christ. I don't want that. I want my own life still. And that reveals that there has not been a true change in our lives. And so you're sitting here and you're, you might be sitting here going, where do I begin? Well, how do I, how do I make this happen in my life? 
I think you begin where, where the leper in Matthew 8 began, where he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. We need to have that belief that we know that Jesus, first of all, is willing and that he can do it. He will do these kinds of wor works in our lives. And that look at how Jesus responded. He reached out, touched the man. He said, I am willing, be clean. And the man was immediately cleansed of his leprosy. So we need to approach God knowing that he is both willing and able to do these kinds of things in our lives. And so let us not forget kind of the overarching thought for this morning, that God's grace not only saves us from our sins, but enables us in growth, imparts God's divine power, necessitates our obedience, and sustains us to live a godly life. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. We give this to you. We love you. We thank you for all that you are doing and all that you are in our lives. And so, Jesus, we give this morning to you. And, Jesus, we ask that we would truly decide this morning that we want to follow you more closely. We want to participate in the divine nature, knowing that you have given us everything we need to live a godly life. It is right there in front of us for the taking. So, God, let us do that. Pray this in your name. Amen.